Obviously, I'm also a professor of chemistry, so I've, I've hit the first three check marks pretty easily. But you can see that you can end up in analytical chemistry, so forensic sciences, um, a lawyer. In fact, I have lots of friends that got their PhD in chemistry and then immediately turned around and went back to law school to become patent lawyers. Because if you have an expertise in chemistry, then you really have an advantage at looking at chemistry patents and saying, oh, this makes sense, this doesn't make sense. And you really have an opportunity to do some interesting things. Um, doctors, medicine, you know, the body is just a whole bunch of chemical reactions going on. And so understanding how chemical reactions, understanding chemistry really gives you an advantage in certain aspects of medicine, medical research being one of them. So there's lots of places, and I won't go through all of these. Uh, you'll see them here where getting a degree in chemistry really gives you a lot of opportunities when you graduate from this degree or when you go on to the next degree, how you can use your chemistry to really move things forward. Um, so there's currently three unique degree paths in chemistry. You can get a general uh, chemistry degree, which is sort of what I what I have, and it's what I would call more of a traditional chemistry path. There's our chemistry biological program, which uh, adds, which sort of focuses a little more on the biological aspects, but it's still a chemistry degree. You'll still end up taking, you know, this almost not quite all the same courses, but all the same core courses. And then sort of towards the end, we'll add a few other courses here and there to round out the biology aspect of it. And we even have a computational chemistry degree. So one thing that a lot of people don't necessarily consider as a good friend of mine uh, says is that sometimes you don't like being in the lab and you think that means that you're not a chemist, but actually some people don't like the wet chemistry. Some people really, really like doing chemistry uh, What's it called? They like doing chemistry, but they don't like doing it in the lab. And so you can do computational chemistry. What happens is you're actually using a computer to study chemical processes and things, biological, uh, small molecules, and all sorts of different chemistry. So if you don't like being in the lab because you don't enjoy that process, but you love chemistry, maybe computational chemistry is for you. And so, you know, I don't want to just discourage you from trying all sorts of different chemistry. Each program is fully accredited by the Chemical Institute of Canada, so it's a fully accredited program. And you can do any of these programs as a general pro program or an honors degree. And I'll talk a little bit more about what you do in an honors degree in a second. So generally speaking, the honors degree requires you to maintain a level of a B or better. So about an average of 75% in all of your uh, classes, except for first year where we give you a little bit of freedom because you're taking a lot of general first year classes and believe me, if I had to take biology and get above a 75, I don't know that I would still be able to do that today, maybe today. The honors degree also requires a two semester research project. So what happens is, is you'll pick, by the time you get to that level, you usually know most of your professors, you see what kind of research they're doing, either you know they'll talk about it during their courses or you'll hear about it from other students. And so you'll go up to a professor and say, I'd really like to do an honors project with you. And you'll end up in two semesters uh, in their lab working on a project um, during a course. So it's about 10 hours a week. Some some weeks you know, can be busier, some weeks are less busy. Depends on the research project, who you're working for, and also how busy you are with all of your other courses. And you usually do this in the final year of your program. And so I've had many honor students working in my lab. Um, almost all the professors, in, well, actually I should say, all the professors in the chemistry department are happy to take honor students to come into the lab and do an honors project. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity to really get your uh, to get an understanding of what research looks like. Um, because often what you see in a lab setting normally, so in a first year lab or a second year lab or a third year lab, these are pre-designed labs that are designed to teach you techniques and teach you about certain aspects of chemistry. But that's not really what happens in a research lab. In a research lab, it's far more oriented where we say, hey, here's a problem that we want to try to solve. Here's a potential solution that we think might work. And then you go into the lab with, of course, support of other students and the supervisor like myself or another professor to really help sort of guide the project and see if we can answer a question with chemistry. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but that's the nature of research. And that's why it's so different than undergraduate labs, because you really get to see what research life is all about. And that's one of the earliest times you might actually get into lab and try this out. Although there's other opportunities that I'll talk to you. Okay, um, so one last thing that's worth saying. So a lot of time we get the question, would taking Chem 1010 or Math 1090 set you behind? So for those of you that might not be aware, Chem 1010 is our 
you uh, if you if your background in chemistry isn't either as strong or you don't have as much of a background in it, then you can take Chem 1010, which will sort of fill in all of that solid foundation. And then when you take Chem 1050 and Chem 1051, you have all of that information, all that knowledge to really sort of set you up for success in 1050 and 1051, and then all the other chemistry classes. And so oftentimes, especially uh, if I'm teaching Chem 1050, you will uh, you will see some students will say, look, I'm really struggling with this. And I'll say, well, have you considered taking Chem 1010 to really build that foundation? Because there's nothing more important than a solid foundation to start with, because everything else builds up uh, on top of that. So there is no harm in taking that. Nobody will look down on anything and you can catch up. You may have to take one course in the summer uh, to catch up, but you can catch up with everything and be right back on track. And so there's no there's no downside to doing this. In fact, I strongly recommend it because everything else builds on that foundation. So really good chemistry foundation uh, is, is the one of the most important things for all of the chemistry classes. What I'll say is my aunt was a chemistry professor in Vancouver, and she would say the exact same thing, that everything you're doing in second year and third year, and even other aspects of 1050 and 1051, rely on that solid foundation. And so she used to beat into me, make sure that that foundation is strong because everything you build, you build on that. And that makes such a huge difference. Same with your math skills and all the other courses as well. Um, I will com take a moment here to comment that I actually can't see the chat window very easily because it'll block part of my screen. So if there is a question, um, I'll either answer it afterwards or if somebody will stop me in the middle and say, hey, there's a question, let's deal with it right now. I can, I can do that. Um, okay, so just to give you kind of a picture of what a semester might look like for you if you're taking a chemistry major or a chemistry honors degree, you'll notice for the most part your first year is the same one way or the other. Chem 1050 in the first semester, Chem 1051 in the second semester. Of course, if you're taking chem chemistry 1010, you might do that in the fall semester, and then you might take 1050 in the winter and 1051 in the summer. I believe there's also an option if you took you could take 1010 in the summer and then 10 jump back into 1050 and 1051. Um, but that might be a little bit too late for anybody starting this September. So may not make that big of a difference at this point. You'll even see your second year more or less looks completely the same. And then once you get to third year, you start to see electives show up. And where the difference is, is that if you're just getting a major in chemistry, we make the electives a little bit broader. Take any electives you want, as long as they fit the criteria that you that they are required to have. However, if you're going to do an honors uh, program, then what happens is, is we make it more specific where you have to take chemistry classes as your electives, and they can be any 4,000 level classes, for example. And of course, you'll notice uh, chemistry 490A and 490B at the bottom there, and those are the research, the honors project uh, research that you'll be taking in your last semester. Now, this is one way to get there. Um, there's other, other courses you can take, of course, um, certainly, my first semester when I was a professor, I took a few less, or when I was a student, sorry, I took less courses in my first year just to get the hang of going to college versus high school. And so I took an extra semester to finish off my degree, but it made a big difference because it got that foundation built really, really well. And I, again, that's one of those things that I think are very, very important. Um, so here's what it looks like if you're doing the chemistry biological program. So you can see that we've introduced biology 1001 and 1002, and you can see that you end up doing more biology courses in your third and fourth year, uh, but you still end up doing, an, if you're doing an honors, you still end up doing an honors in chemistry. So you'll do a 498 and a 490 being the chemistry department. It won't necessarily be with biological project, projects, but there are many researchers that do do biological projects, and so you have an opportunity to work on those as well. So there's lots of um, uh, opportunities to do all sorts of different research. Um, and then the computational chemistry major and honors program, uh, I'll leave this up here for a little bit. And again, you get into you get the opportunity to do a Chem 490A and a 490B in the honors project, which again is your research opportunities. And there's plenty of chemists that do computational work uh, in the chemistry department. And of course, even if you get a computational chemistry degree, doesn't mean that you have to do a honors program in uh, computational chemistry. You can do an honors program in any research group um, that you want, right? So don't rule out uh, the type of research you do. In fact, as long as it's in the chemistry department, I think you can do any research program uh, 
you can work for anyone you want. Okay, um, so we also have some joint honors. So you can do a chemistry applied math, uh, chemistry biochemistry, chemistry earth sciences, chemistry physics. I don't think I'd want to do the chemistry biochemistry when it was me, um, but I would certainly have done the chemistry physics and the chemistry applied math uh, uh, when I was a when I was a student. And you can also we also have a chemistry minor program, so you only take up to part of the windows in the way. There we go. The chemistry 1050, 1051, some second year courses, and some and uh, I know two other courses that are either second year or higher courses. You can have a minor in chemistry as well. All of this information is available online, of course. Um, if you want to declare a chemistry major program, then you have to email the manager of the academic program, which is Dr. Barry Power. So he's the academic program officer, um, my right hand man. Sometimes the guy that I ask all the questions to, and as I'm getting used to this role as deputy head. Declaring a program puts you on the radar for the department, provides you with the academic advisor in the department, and makes you eligible for awards in the chemistry department. So if you are going to be a, get a chemistry degree, it's very important to do this. Um, I think so you can always contact. So if there is research you're interested in, which might not be something you're thinking about today, uh, then you can contact any professor in the chemistry department. Then most professors a little bit trickier nowadays will be happy to take you through their lab and give you a tour. They'll be happy to talk about the research that they're doing. If you have any more questions about sort of first year stuff, you can email either Dr. Barry Power or myself, uh, and we'd be happy to answer any questions about that. So that's the sort of the first part of what I wanted to, to quickly talk about. Um, I know some people have questions about what labs are going to look like and what courses are going to look like this next semester. And I'll do the best I can to answer some of those questions. Um, what I'll tell you is to the as far as I can rec remember, almost all the courses, well, actually, all the courses are being taught remotely. Now, what that means can be different depending on what course you're taking and who the instructor is. So it could be a synchronous class where someone says, okay, I'm going to lecture from you know nine until ten. That's the hour I have you for. And you will log in the same way you're logged in right now, and I will teach you the course content. Others might choose to do a video for 40 minutes or a video for five minutes and then give you assignments to sort of work on on your own time. So every course will be a little bit different. For my third year class, I'm going to do a synchronous class, I believe, where I will actually just teach the way I normally do, um, and then make my classes just a little bit shorter to give students time to work on their other assignments because everybody will be a little bit busier probably this semester than, than normally is what I suspect. With regards to labs for first year chemistry, all, our, all of our labs are virtual. And so what will happen is, is um, for every week that you have a lab, you will have, you'll be told when the lab starts, there will be a series of either videos or uh, some set of instructions on what what happened in the lab, and then you'll use that information or the combination of that information to do your lab report and submit it online. So there will be no first year labs, at least in chemistry, that are in person at the moment. Um, so that's how all the labs will happen. The same will happen in upper division, second and third year classes as well for the most part. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I'm missing about the labs. All the courses have a lot of TAs. We've actually requested more TAs than we normally request, and that's for the students. Um, we want to make sure that because everything is virtual, because everybody's away from each other, that students have as much time to interact with professors and, and TAs as possible to make sure that everybody's getting an opportunity to ask questions from their professors, ask questions from their TAs. And we even have our virtual help center, which you'll, if you're taking a first year class, you'll be introduced to, um, is available far more than usual with making sure we put as many professors and as many students there as possible to help you. Um, so that's what's going to happen. So you'll actually have more time to interact uh, with students and professors to make sure that you understand the foundational chemistry that you need to know. So you won't, I don't think you'll be missing out. Um, I wish, and I think we all wish it was in person, but we're doing our best to make sure that we deliver the content to you in a way that will ensure that you get all the information that you normally would. Okay. Um, I briefly want to talk about sort of doing undergraduate research in the Department of Chemistry and in general. And partially because it's something when I was a first year student, I didn't even think about research. I didn't know what research was. I didn't know what publications were. I didn't know anything about it. And I really wish somebody would have told me more about it 
then. Probably wouldn't have changed where I ended up today, but it would have gotten me into the lab sooner, and I think that would have been a very valuable experience for me. Again, people with chemistry degrees have got all sorts of jobs. Uh, we've already sort of covered this. They end up as professors at different universities. So Brad Easton is one of a, a chemistry undergraduate, or he did her PhD, did his PhD here, and now he's at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology doing research. So there's lots of professors all over Canada that have done their PhDs. Here and they've also done their undergraduate research here. Um, why should you do research? Well, I always find, especially even now, that when you're really sort of digging into certain chemistry, that you get a better understanding of the science when you do this. And then from even just doing undergraduate research, medical schools, dental schools, and graduate schools give priority to students who have research experience. And so especially when it comes down to me writing you a reference letter. If I taught you one class, I'm happy to write you a reference letter, but there's a limited number of things I can say about you. But if you worked in a lab, I can say, oh, they're a hard worker. They you know, were able to solve these problems. I can say a lot more about you than I could if I taught you a class, you got an 80% or an 85% in my class, uh, other students got above, some students got below, and you know you run out of things to say very quickly. So research gives you the opportunity to introduce yourself to all the professors and get those reference letters that you would want for future things. Lots of scholarship opportunities in chemistry, and so we have about 22 scholarships that we grant annually. Um, so that's another uh, good reason to do research in labs and get known by the professors. There's a lot of social uh, and academic societies, and so our undergraduates travel to Science Atlantic uh, chemistry conferences. They didn't last year, of course. Um, with any luck, we'll be able to do it this year, but we'll see. It also really helps your CV, your resume, where you can put all of these things that you've done, all the research experiences you have, um, all of the reference letters, all of the all of the things that you've done during your time that aren't just, hey, look, these are the courses I got. You add those to your resume, and then when you're going to medical school or you're applying for graduate schools, people can see all the different things you have done, and this makes a huge difference uh, and can really separate one student out from a different student. Um, publishing papers, this is certainly something that uh, we do lots of in the chemistry department. Um, one of the things that happens when you're working in the lab, you do good research, and then that research for other people in the chemistry community at other universities to know about it, the only way to do this is to publish a paper. And so what happens, and it's not uncommon, undergraduate researchers will be will get their papers published in reputable, high quality journals. So you'll see in the top left corner, Jen Smith who was an undergraduate student working for Chris Riley. She was getting publications. Um, in fact, all of these papers that you see here are from undergrads that worked in the chemistry department and got papers. So it's a great opportunity. I certainly to this day remember my very first publication um, and probably will always remember the process of getting there. And it's a wonderful thing and it really sort of made me want to do more research. There's tons of ways to get into the research labs. You can do MUSEPs, which are 40 or 80, 80 hour work placements in different labs. Uh, SWAS, NSERC USRA, so the federal government pays for summer for students to work in labs during the summer. Um, you apply through Memorial, and you shouldn't think that because you're a first year student that you're not going to get one of these. I can list off five or six people over the five or six years that I've been here that have gotten these, gotten into labs, gotten papers, have ended up in medical school, in graduate school, so on and so forth. So don't think that you're too young to get into the lab. Um, there's always opportunities and there's always just to go see a lab. Don't don't rule it out. And of course, the honors project, of course, which we've already talked about um, a little bit more about the swaths and the MUSEP program over here, but you can find all this information online. Um, there's also opportunities to travel to other countries. So the DAD rise internship and send you to Germany. Um, I've known people that have done this program. And so it's a great opportunity to see how other countries are doing research. Um, which is always interesting because you learn a lot about different approaches by seeing different groups and how they work in different countries and how they work. Not to mention you get to travel to places you may have never been to before, which I think is a wonderful opportunity, especially considering this is my fourth city and third country in my life that I've lived in. So not to mention the ones I've traveled to. 
and my third language by now. All right, so that's all I have to say right now. Um, I'm going to close this down and open up the chat window. And if there's any questions, try to address them. Again, my apologies for not being able to see all the chats as I gave the presentation. Uh, it's not set up on my screen well to do so, so I'm sorry for that. Hi, Dr. Katz. Um, a couple of questions that came in. Um, is an overall average of 75% the passing grade or just the grade that determines eligibility for honors? So uh, if you want to be in the honors program, you have to have an average of 75. So it is possible for you to have averages like courses that you've done poor in. Certainly I could list courses that I didn't do as great in as, uh, as I would have liked to. Um, we've all been there. We all have bad semesters or certain topics that you just don't connect with the same way that you connect with other topics. So the honors requires you to have an average of 75%. It doesn't require you to have a 75 in every course, just the average. Um, I had it on one and then the chat changed. Um, scroll back. Um, I am hoping to major biochem prerequisite. Um, chemistry 1015, 1051, or 1010 and 1050. Does that mean I can do chem 1010 and 1050 only, or do I have to do 1051? Um, it's a good question. Uh, you can't replace, I don't believe you can replace 1051 by doing 1050 and, or 1010 and 1050. I believe you're going to need to do 1050 and 1051. Um, but I'd have to go take a look. I don't know if Barry powers around to pull my foot out of my own mouth here if I, if he is to speak up. Um, but I believe you're yourself to take 1050 and 1051. Yeah, I'm just reading that question back. It seems like you said, I am hoping to major biochem. And so that seems like that might be more of a question for the biochemistry department, um, unless you meant the chemistry biological major. Uh, if it's a chemistry biological, then yes, you'll need to do 1050 and 1051. There's, you can't take any upper divisions. I think there might be one chemistry course you can take in second year uh, without doing 1051, but you have to have 1051 by the time you finish that course or else you can't go on. So you do need 1051 uh, for any chemistry degree or any of the ones we talked about. Um, I see one question going back to the average. If your average is below 75, what can you do? You can retake a course. Um, if your average is below 75, you can retake a course and that will bump up your average. You don't always have to redo the labs. As long as you pass the labs with a high enough grade, you can get a lab waiver that will say, okay, look, we're going to give you the same grade in the lab that you got before, but what we're going to do is just let you take the course and put that in there. What I will say, because some of the labs are virtual versus in person, if you get a lab waiver for a virtual lab, it will only count, or sorry, if you do a virtual lab, and let's say you don't do well in the course for whatever reason, you can only get a lab waiver for the next semester if the labs are still virtual. Once the labs go back to being in person, if you've taken a virtual lab, we will require you to now take the virtual lab because we really wanna make sure that you get hands-on experience of working with the glassware and working with chemicals and whatnot. Um, if it's your first semester, can you join the MUSEP program now? Yes, I don't remember when the deadline is for the MUSEP program, but you certainly can still apply for a MUSEP program and get into some of the labs and do some work in the lab. So yeah, doesn't matter whether you're, where you are, it's just an opportunity to get some experience in the different labs. Um, I believe for the MUSEP, um, Megan, you're in the chat, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, for the MUSEPs, they open the first full Friday, or the, the Friday of the first full week, and the applications remain open until the following Friday, which would be two Fridays from now, I'm pretty sure, is when they would open. Um, I two more questions. Will chemistry major cover organic or inorganic chemistry? Do we have the option to choose? So up until third year, you will be taking, so you'll take all of first year chemistry. Second year will be inorganic chemistry, physical chemistry, and organic chemistry. In third year, you will take inorganic chemistry, I believe materials chemistry as well. Those are in, on the inorganic side of it. I know I teach both of them right now. <laughs> and you will also be able to take organic chemistry. So 
at some point, the electives, you can sort of say, I want to take more inorganic or I want to take more organic, but there's a core set of courses that are a mixture of organic, physical, analytical. I'm just listening to the one before me, just to see how it went. And so that that will, uh, so, you have, so you're required to take that. So you don't really get to sort of specialize until you get to your electives. Um, when can you decide that you want to do an honors? Is there any application process for it? Most students, so if you're entering your fourth and final year, most students, the semester, well, not even the semester, the winter before, will reach out to professors and say, hey, I'm interested in doing an honors. And if you know who you want to work for, you might just go to one professor and say, I would like to do an honors with you. And you do this towards the end of the semester. So let's, let's say May. Some people will not really make that decision until sometime in the summer where they go, you know, I do want to do a research program. So they might reach out to somebody later. I suggest reaching out as early as possible because sometimes some faculty members only have so much space in their lab. And so if you really want to work for somebody, it's better to talk to them about it sooner. As a, with regards to an application process, there's no application process as long as a faculty member will take you. And if you're an honors, if you're taking an honors chemistry program, chemistry is required to make sure that you can do an honors research project. So we will make sure that you can get into the into a lab and do research. Um, and then we just do an add drop form, which we've set up for the semester where you just say, okay, I'm taking this course. I submit it to the registrar's office and you're in the course, no questions asked. So there is no application process. There's no interview process. It's just, I would like to do research and Hopefully, uh, you know, we'll be all in person able to do that very well. Although we are doing honors projects this coming semester, which won't affect most of you, any of you probably, but we are, our research labs are active. Can we get research publications by working in MUSA positions or being undergraduate and volunteers in the lab? Um, absolutely. Um, you, I can't rule it out. I mean, projects take amounts of time. I can't tell you that if you work you know, a whole semester you'll get a paper, or if you work four semesters, you'll get a paper. Projects take as long as they take. Some research groups publish faster, some slower, and it's not the group, it's the research. Some research programs are not just the way the research works, it's slower or faster um, relative to other ones, but good papers always come out. So you absolutely can get a, a research publication where it certainly, one of my very first undergraduate students published my very first paper when I started here back in January 2015. We published that. Uh, I submitted the paper on December 1st, 2015. I know that because that's my birthday and I was doing it at the dinner table while my mom was giving me a look that said, put your laptop away or else I'll still hit you. I don't care if you're a university professor. Um, do professors support chemistry related inventions? Um, certainly we do. I have a patent. Other professors here have patents. It is something that we are all interested in if we, if the work leads to that. Um, so, yeah, we certainly support that and the university, I think more importantly, the university fully supports that and has a whole office dedicated that if we have a really interesting invention, a chemical, a molecule that we can do things with it. Now I'm going to scroll back up. Feel free to ask more questions if you had them, but I'm afraid that I've missed questions early on. I see a question here. Um, you posted courses earlier for honors. Will all these courses be offered every year? We wouldn't want to get stuck waiting for a course to be offered. So all of the core courses are offered every year. Um, so, I mean, 1010, 1050, 1051, all the second year organic, all the second year inorganic, all the second year analytical. The courses that might not be offered every year um, are sort of the elective fourth year courses where they might be offered every other year. And so sometimes it's good to take a look at when the course was last offered, but the last few times it was offered. So, for example, if you're very interested in green chemistry, uh, Dr. Curtin teaches the green chemistry class, and I don't recall if she does it every year or if she does it every other year, but those are the courses where you could end up um, missing out. So it's important to find out. So if you see the course offered in your third year and you're like, well, I was going to take it in my fourth year, it might be very good to go talk to the professor and say, will this also be offered next year or should I take it this year? And nobody's, as long as you have the prerequisites or as long as 
a professor will sign you, essentially sign you out of the prerequisites, you can always take a fourth year course during your third year if that means you get to take that course versus not take that course. But all the core courses that you have to take absolutely offered every year um, without exception as far as I can as far as I can remember. I'm not sure if you already answered this question, but um, what is the main difference between a biochem major and a chemistry biological major? That's a good question. Um, I don't, I'll, I'll just admit that I don't actually know the complete differences between the two in terms of this is what the courses are, but the chemistry biological program, it's a chemistry degree. So it's very heavily based on chem you're taking chemistry courses. And then what we're doing is we're saying, look, we're going to augment the chemistry learning with some of the biochemistry or biology courses. So you get that biological aspect, but it's a very chemistry heavy program, whereas opposed to biochemistry is the, the biochemistry department runs it. And it's a very heavy biochemistry course focusing specifically on biochemistry. So you might not take third year in organic chemistry for me, or well, if you're not taking it for me right now, I don't know who you're taking it from. You might not take the course at all in a biochemistry degree, but if you're taking uh, chemistry biological, I'd have to go back and double check, but you are taking third year in organic chemistry with me or third year materials chemistry with me. And none of those are courses that you would be required to take if you were in biochemistry. So the, so the core courses might stay more or less the same, but I think from chemistry, physics, biology, you're almost always taking first year chemistry, first year biology, first year physics. So the core first year courses stay more or less the same. It's just that as you get into the upper division years, it starts to sort of spread out as, okay, chemistry biological has you doing more chemistry, whereas biochemistry has you doing more biochemistry itself. Is chemistry 1050 textbook available? Yes, if you're taking uh, chemistry 1050, the textbook is available. Um, I don't know, I would have to pop up an email to do this, but if you email your 1050 professor, they can tell you all the information. Also check the D2L shell, which hopefully is active by now, and you should have information about the textbook. Um, so chemistry textbooks are available. I saw a few emails about them a couple of weeks ago, or at least they they will be available by the time you have to take your first class for sure. There is an opportunity, I think, to download the PDF version of the book when you buy it, or it could be that if you buy the book, you immediately get the PDF version of it. I don't know as well because I'm not teaching first year, so I've you know steered away from paying attention to uh, 1050 textbook issues in that regard. But you will have a textbook. That's not a problem. Um, one question: How different is Chem 1010 from Chem 1050? Hold on a second. It's your Chem 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 50 and 1051 textbook right here. Um, the first four chapters, I believe, are 1010. So 1010 covers the first four chapters, which is sort of the foundational chemistry knowledge, concepts about the mole, um, concepts about you know nomenclature. So the first four chapters, chemical reactions and stoichiometry, all are covered in 1010. We assume that everything in the first four chapters you already know when you start 1050 and that you understand it well enough to go straight into gases, thermochemistry, and quantum, which is what we cover in 1050. So if those topics are, if the first four chapters are topics that you may have learned, but you know, you're, you're still missing some, you're not as solid on them as you would like to be, or you find the start of 1050, you say, hold on a second, there's a lot going on here that I don't quite remember then 1010 might be a better place to start to really build that foundation because one semester out of the four years where you have to take a course in the summer to make up for this is not worth having a rocky foundation where you just are confused and you're struggling when taking the core foundational course will just give you that edge over everybody else. So don't ever hesitate to take 1010 if you feel that you're missing those, those concepts. Um, 1010 will cover a little bit briefly gases and thermo, but very, very quickly, just enough to give you the feeling for what you're going to start with in 1050. So if anything, it also gives you that entryway to the first couple of weeks of 1050 so that you are easy to catch up and easy to keep up with everybody. And this book will run you for 1010, 1050, and 1051. Um, and occasionally I will still look through it when you know I'm trying to refresh my mind on something. 
well, where did I get that textbook? I've had that textbook since I taught the course the first time. I got it directly from the from the author and the publishing group. So, but uh, you will get the textbook at the bookstore. I don't know how they're arranging pickups and everything. Um, you, I think this way. If you can't find that information for your professor, let me know, and I will take a look at it. But all the professors should know all the information about the textbook. It might even be on the D2L shell, which again, hopefully is active for your class. If not, your professors will activate them shortly. And I think they self activate some semesters. I've put my foot in my mouth and posted lots of things on D2L that nobody ever saw for two weeks. Um, let's see. The bookstore is doing a local pickup if you're in the St. John's area. Um, and also, they're willing to ship anywhere in the world. There you go. Answers to my questions. Thank you, Carter. Uh, can we work on research with professors in a different department? As long as that professor is okay with it, uh, there's no reason why you can't. So there's lots of people in engineering and process engineering that are cross-listed with chemistry or just they do a lot of chemistry related things. And so they don't have a problem with it. I mean, as long as a professor is willing to say, yes, you can work in anybody's lab and very few professors say no. Everybody wants students to come in and get the experience because I remember the first time I was in a lab and I will probably remember it for the rest of my life. And I hope that every single one of you gets that exact same experience that I got um, in, in some way, shape or form in somebody's lab. Um, there are ebooks available for the textbook. For someone interested in both bio and chem, what kind of major would work best? Biochem, chemistry, biological. Uh, I think that's a bit of a, that's a personal question. I think it's really a question of what you are more interested in. And you might not know today uh, because you're just starting off. So I would, you know, maybe don't declare for the first year, take the bio courses, take the chem courses, and ask yourself, what do you enjoy more? So if you enjoy the bio more, you can do a biology degree and you can do a minor in chemistry. If you do like the chemistry more, you can do the chemistry biological and then have all of your electives just do more of the bio courses so that you can get more of that, those experiences. So I think that's a, unfortunately, that's a very personal question, even though it doesn't sound like it. For me, I didn't do any minors. I did a chemistry majors and I almost did a physics, math, and nuclear science minor. I just didn't, I just wanted to take all those courses and I didn't want it, want to worry about getting a minor or not getting a minor. And that was my personal decision. And you know, I don't regret it. You'll notice no biology uh, in those three near minors. Uh, very important. Not my not my strong suit for what I wanted and what I was good at. Uh, if I was a psychology or biology major and I wanted to do a MUSEP in chemistry, is that possible? Um, I will be, or will you be less likely because you're in a different department? I think it is possible. Um, again, I, if, if, you're, if your experiences align well with what the professor is interested in, then it doesn't matter what department you're in. Um, there is more of a tendency to say, okay, well, we would like you to have some certain level of chemistry knowledge, because you're going to a chemistry lab and we need you to understand certain sort of risks and hazards and some chemistry. But there are people in the chemistry department that do a lot of biological related research where the chemistry um, skills they can teach you, but you're coming in with some interesting biological tests. So, you know, uh, Professor uh, Cahill, who's a new hire, she does a lot of studies on uh, birth related biological things and she does a lot of imaging. And so she would be somebody that might not necessarily need you to have as high of a chemistry level, but would love somebody with a biological uh, experiences. And so there's lots of professors in the department that have different areas. So if you see somebody that you're interested in working in, apply. The worst case scenario, you don't get the position, but you can apply to more than one. You can, and you know, an old boss of mine says the worst thing somebody will ever say to you is no, and that's not that bad. So never hesitate to ask the question because no's are okay. And they're not necessarily saying no to you. They're saying yes to somebody else, which is another important thing. Never take it personally. Keep applying for things. Keep talking to professors. All of those things will fall into place nicely. 
Uh, will Chemistry 1050 have assignments that may require academic integrity, like citations and all? Um, I'll answer this in two ways. Chem 1050 does have assignments. You will have a combination of uh, master in chemistry and assignments. So that's part of the textbook comes with a series of questions. And then as you go over them in the course, those quite you sort of do that chapters. I think most chapters are split into three or four sections and you'll do those sort of questions. And that's where some of your grades will come from. It's a great way to sort of keep on top of the topics. Uh, every not every student will get different questions, but they, uh, there's usually a set of five questions that are in the same boat, and each you know student will get one of those five questions, and so it makes it difficult for students to. You can still work together, but you might not get the same questions. Um, in terms of academic integrity, we are you know academic integrity is one of the most important things, but I think what you mean in the question is different than when I'm interpreting it. There isn't. You're not going to have to cite primary literature and read papers. Uh, for Chem 1050 or 1051, sometimes professors will put some interesting papers up on their D2L shell, which talk about study habits, which is something that, you know, I'll let you know when I finally figure out how to do that myself. It's actually one of the harder skills to figure out how you yourself learn. So a lot of professors will put resources up to try to help you figure out your learning style. Um, some people love learning in groups personally. I don't learn very well in groups. I learn much better on my own. Uh, with a whiteboard and sort of a very, you know, be myself and I approach, but that doesn't work for everybody. So just because it's working for some people doesn't mean it works for you. Um, even learning how to read a textbook. Uh, a lot of times people read textbooks the way they read novels. They're just enjoying the book. That's not the way to read a textbook. You want to read small sections and you want to really think about what it's telling you and come up with a way of connecting with it. So when I teach 1050, for example, I use analogies a lot because for me, and maybe even here I've used a lot of analogies, for me, analogies are how I make connection between things I know and things I'm starting to know. And once I make that connection, the, the rest of the chemistry sort of starts to fill in those gaps and go, well, is it exactly like this? Well, no, it's more like this, but I need to first connect with it. And so when I read a chemistry book and I read, when I teach a class, I read a textbook all the time, especially 1050, I'll go through the chapter, I'll go through the section I'm teaching, and I'll say, okay, what's a good example of this? Is that does this make sense? Is this something I can demonstrate in class? And so for every one hour lecture you'll see me for, I'm probably spending two or three hours just working on that same section, trying to find a way to connect with the students and the content. And so when you're reading a textbook, that's also what you should be doing. Don't try to read all at once before the test. Read the night every day, read a small amount and try to connect with it and ask yourself, what is this telling you? And once you can kind of explain it, it really starts to sink in very well. And again, this is to me one of the hardest skills that I've had to learn over. And I mean, I can tell you the number of times I've had to remind myself that I have to read books. I still have to read textbooks today, and I still have to read a lot of chemistry today to keep on top of that knowledge. Um, how do we request the professor give us a prerequisite waiver form? Uh, if you need a prerequisite waiver, I think what you should do is email the professor and if it's first year chemistry, also email Barry Power and explain why you need a prerequisite waiver and they can arrange it. It might end up coming to my desk at some point, but usually Barry Power handles almost all the first year stuff very, very well. How can we make relationships with our professors during these remote lectures? Um, yeah, usually you would have some opportunity to talk to your professors. I suspect this, unfortunately, you're going to have a lot less time to make those connections than you normally would. Um, professors have office hours, so if you have questions for your chemistry classes, that's something that's going on, you can go meet them there and talk to them about that. Uh, what I will tell you is that from what I've heard from the summer, um, a lot more student, professors are getting a lot more emails than they normally would have. So if your professor doesn't email you right away, Make check D2L to see if the answer is already on D2L and be patient. Uh, you know, I, I heard of one professor getting 50 emails from one class in one day. And so the emails do get a little bit um, more than the uh, faculty can handle. So you might actually, some professors are setting up so that you'll have contact with TAs and you'll have 
that TA will have 20 students, so you'll have a much closer relationship with them. Um, but don't worry, as the years go on and we go back to you know seeing each other in real life, um, hopefully, uh, you'll have lots of opportunities to meet your professors. So there's social events, the chemistry department, every two weeks, the undergraduate chemistry society does a social, most of the professors show up, and it's a great opportunity to not have that, you know, professor student, you know, I'm teaching a class, you're learning from me relationship where you can actually just say, oh, hey, what kind of research do you do? We also, and I don't know how we're gonna do it this year, we do a research event where we sort of tell, have students uh, can come and we can we talk about what different people in the chemistry department are doing. That will happen. It'll end up on your D2L shells when we have more information. We just have to figure out how everything is going to look like this year. And uh, well, we don't have a lot of answers some days. Um, uh, so I think, I hope I've addressed the question. Somebody asked, while well, textbooks have many pages, I know. Uh, do we have to learn them all in a single semester? How do we read them slowly and understand stuff? Uh, the way that for me, um, if you know what section is being covered the next day, one of the most important things you can do is read that first. If the prof is teaching it to you for the first time, you're getting the early part of the understanding. But if you read it first, the book will give you the early part. The prof will give you the next part. Well, they'll make the next set of connections that you can now really sort of process. And the questions, doing questions is actually one of the best ways you say, okay, and not questions with the answer key in front of you where you say, oh yeah, I can get that answer. I too can get any answer if you tell me what the answer is. I'm very good at getting the right answer with the answer book. But doing a question and saying, okay, does this make sense? Draw yourself pictures when somebody says, okay, well, I have a balloon that's doing this. Draw yourself a picture of what that might look like. Try to ask yourself, is the number gonna get larger or smaller? And start thinking about it, but bite-sized chunks. If you try to sit there and study for 10 hours because you have an exam the next day, you're going to learn the first two hours of material, maybe the few hours after that. But at some point, you're just staring at a textbook um, and you're probably just as well off to you know, sleep with it in the hopes that osmosis is going to work. You can't store that much information that fast. Read it slowly. So if you want to know what reading you'll do or what the prof will cover in the next class, you can always ask them, what are we covering in the next class? Or what section should I be reading in the next class? When I teach 1050, I always have a, here's lecture one, this is what section I'm covering in the book, here's what questions you should be able to do at the end, and here's the learning objectives that I would like you to get from this lecture. And I have that up ahead of time so that students can say, okay, this is what's expected of me, I'm gonna go read this, I'm gonna make notes. Make yourself notes, in fact, you know, when I, when I make notes, that's what I'm teaching from. I make myself notes on how I would explain this to myself, and I'm hoping that that's how I would explain it to, to you. So make yourself a set of notes for yourself and try to find a way to teach that to other people. And that works really, really well for me. And again, everybody learns a different way, um, but slow and steady throughout the semester is the best way to learn. If you try to learn it all at once, it's just hard to fill in all of those gaps. And so, yeah, you're passing courses, but you could pass them with not just better grades, because grades aren't everything, but a better and deeper understanding. And I think that's actually the most important thing. I don't care if I get a C or a B or an A in a class for myself. I care that I understand the material. And once I understand the material, I can go back and, you know, use it later. So there's plenty of courses that I've taken, linear algebra, I really struggled with, but I learned from it so much. And then it applies in chemistry so often that when I actually see it in chemistry, I'm much more confident and able to do that kind of chemistry now because of it, even though if you saw how well I did in the course, wouldn't call it my top, my top grade at all. So, you know, we all, we all have it. So that's, uh, that's my suggestion for that. Um, explain waivers again. Lab waivers, I'll explain lab waivers because that's the ones I know the most. If you took 1050 last, let's say you took 1050 over the summer, um, but for some reason you didn't do as well as you would like or you didn't pass the course, but you passed the lab. And passing the lab, I believe, requires you to have a 65%. You say, well, I could take the course and the lab again, or maybe I just 
take the lab grade and say, look, maybe not the best grade I ever got in the lab, but if the lab grade can transfer over, then I can just focus on the course. So what happens is, is you can request for a lab waiver in that case. Um, and so what happens is, is that you could say, okay, I have a lab waiver. I'm going to put that into the course. And the way it works, if you took a virtual lab, we will give you a waiver for another course that has a virtual lab. If you did the labs in person, so last any time last year, and now they're all virtual, don't worry, the in-person labs will waive the uh, virtual labs. However, at some point, I hope, we go from virtual labs back to in-person. The virtual labs will not count towards in-person lab, in-person labs as a waiver because the skills that you're learning in the lab are so valuable that we feel it's very, very important to get sort of, you know, your hands dirty, so to speak, but wear gloves, wear safety glasses, you know, not actually dirty. Um, so, yeah, so somebody, is this only if you didn't pass the course? Yes, the only way you get a lab waiver for another course, for the, for the same course, you can't ask for a lab waiver for a course you haven't taken yet um, at all. Um, I already have credits for 1050 and 1051. Do I also have the credits for lab classes? We don't have lab classes. So you, if you already have credits for 1050 and 1051, then you don't have to take the 1050, 1051 labs. Uh, can we skip the remote classes? Is there a penalty? Um, you can skip any class you want. Um, uh, so there is no penalty. What I will say is that, you know, at, some point you want to pick up the material. And so if the if you miss a class here and there, I understand that there's everybody's got things going on in their lives. Sometimes you've got an assignment due in a class, and with everybody doing everything remotely, uh, you might find yourself more overwhelmed than what the intent is to keep you, I guess, equally overwhelmed as we normally do, or underwhelmed would be ideal. And so you might skip a class periodically because you need time to work on another assignment, another lab, or personal things. We all have personal things going on as well, and we all understand it. So you can skip a class and there shouldn't be any detriment to your grade. What might happen is, is if there are in-person questions for that lecture, you don't get to answer. For 1050, we do this a lot where we have those clicker style questions, although we do them off of the phone or the computer now. Um, so you would miss those questions. But what most profs will do is instead of saying you have to do all of them, we say, listen, we understand that some days you're just not feeling answering those questions or you're lost or you can't come to class. And so we say, look, if we ask you 100 questions throughout the semester, we'll ask you more than 100 questions. Um, we'll say, you know, 20% of them, we don't care if you did or didn't answer them. And a lot of the times it's not about answering those questions right. It's about attempting them. Because one thing that's very, very important in research and in chemistry and in everything is being able to ask questions and being wrong. Because you say, okay, well, I think that if I do this, this number gets larger. Don't worry about being wrong. If the number gets smaller, you can go, okay, I thought it was going this way, but it's actually going this way. Why? What am I missing? What am I not connecting with? Being afraid to answer questions or only wanting the right answer isn't as important as saying, this is what I think, this is why I think it, and then you can correct that. So make sure that if even if you're not sure about an answer, if it's a multiple choice question, say, well, I think it should be this and ask yourself why and deal with it that way. So missing classes is, of course, possible. There won't be any detriment. I would say don't skip all of your classes. That's a recipe for cramming the night before a test. And, you know, that ends up only hurting you in the long run because by the time you start cramming for one course, you're missing out on another course. And this has a way of just ruining that foundational knowledge, which is literally the most important thing and why I keep bringing it up is that Everything builds on that. And you'd be surprised how often simple first year chemistry concepts come back up that if you have that foundation, you don't even realize you're just saying, oh, it's just.